just two conscious guys talking where conscious male leaders come together and have a discussion that is deep, that is nourishing, that allows us to see the illumination of consciousness that's unfolding progressively for men that are waking up in the world and where you can get insights on your own awakening as a man and also for amazing women that want to learn more about men's challenges and struggles that have created some of the dysfunction we've seen within men in its society, often called, quote unquote, the patriarchy and other terms. What created it? What is the genesis of it all? What can we do about it today to empower men to be all that they're meant to be and to support the awakening of consciousness for men and women and all? Well, it's great to be here with you, and you're hanging out there in the forest. <laughs> People are looking at you here online. I see you out there in the forest. Feels so good, Zen, to be with you today. Oh, thanks, Daniel. It feels so good to be here and to be in the forest, at, at least um, imaginarily, right? Um, yeah. It's that imaginal space that really helps us to be co-creative in the process of living, doesn't it? It's just... It's just... So it, may, it does actually evoke when I think about men and whatnot, like, all right, let's get out the hunting rifles and let's get out there and do some fishing and, <laughs> and all kinds I'm of I'm sure there are plenty here, you know, um, but in respect to the, the place and the honor and, and why I have this picture, you know, I, uh, I do my own podcast and I open with namaste and in La Ketch. And those are two ancient phrases. One's Sanskrit, one's Mayan. The Sanskrit means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. Actually, I think they say worship. Uh, we don't understand what that means. Um, and the other, in La Ketch, is a shortened in La Ketch a la Ken, and it means simply, I am another you. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. That's beautiful. Well, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have this chat with you, because you're one of those people that's got endless knowledge and information. and uh, has I know nothing. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. I know. We all know nothing as we're filled with all kinds of fascinating ideas and information, right? So yeah. And experiences. Too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, but yeah, into the theme of talking about guys and what's going on. I mean, what's it like to be a guy these days? Uh, is that, I mean, uh, are you more focused on the intergalactic uh, federation or things like that these days? <laughs> I, 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 you know what I mean? It's like, what are, it's, it's interesting where our focus is in our band. Well, yes. And energies. Yeah, you know, um, having the, the wonderful, exquisite experience I've had in life, uh, starting as an orphan, being adopted, uh, raised by a 32nd degree Mason and a school teacher that was just, you know, uh, inspired the curiosity to learn and grow and to build a vocabulary and, and value systems. And then being in DMLA as a teenager, I was master counselor at 15. So I, I was given these really good foundations. And my parents married 61 years before their separation uh, my father's death in 2013 and mom just passed in uh, last October so growing up in that small town Indiana um, we were actually called the uh, what was the label yeah it was the, the small town USA and the claim to that fame was the first natural gas well in Indiana um, so that was <laughs> you know a small thing but at that time it was huge and then uh, over the years, you know, you get embedded with that, living around them, the unconditional love that they showed for me, my sister, who was also adopted four years younger, and how they showed it for each other. Um, unfortunately, you know, when we got older, they said, you know, we never let you guys see us argue, which was a mistake. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I had to learn that <laughs> after I got married. And the, the practice marriage of 10 years didn't really work. We had four kids and I've got seven great grandkids now. Um, and we were divorced in 88. Now in that process though, of becoming a father, husband, provider, um, I put my best foot forward 
Um, I tried to pursue finishing my degree. Uh, I put in copious hours at work. She didn't work. Uh, I was active at one point um, for probably seven of the 10 years we were active in the Mormon church. And so I was doing those kinds of things and uh, ended up getting the Melchizedek priesthood, which is a physical bestowal of something. And, and you know, later after I left, it's like, oh, OK, that was really the only reason I was there, because I really wanted to follow the lineage and the teachings of Jesus. And him being after the order of Melchizedek, it seemed that was one of the things that I ought to be able to experience. And so I did. Mm -hmm. um, my experience in the church, a wonderful from a, a people place, um, horrible from a, not horrible, but at least um, disappointing from an administrational place. Um, most hierarchies are that way. However, they really do take care of their people. And, and I admire the, that work that they yes. do. Mm -hmm. having to be in that place i suffered greatly because it took me away from my wife and children and instead of getting involved with the church she chose to have affairs um, didn't realize that her insecurity was so deep and so that affected it wasn't a, a reflection of me whatsoever Although I tried to make it so, and even even Dad says, you know, it takes two to tango. You know, what are you doing, and and what you know? Uh, and he was so focused on marriage that after he died in their assisted living apartment, in the drawer next to the bed was a manual about how to be a good husband mm -hmm. that was like a hundred years old. Mm. And so he still had this. You know, he was eighty-two at the time. <laughs> so. You know, having those kinds of things uh, being brought up with doing the right thing, no matter how difficult it was, he instilled that in me and even said at one point, you know, do what needs to be done, do the hardest that needs to be done first, because then you'll be free of stress to handle the rest. Mm. And so my quest is, okay, you know, his, his Piscean and his um, question that just so constant, it was ridiculous. You know, my sister and I actually joked with him after a while because he'd enter a room. Okay, what's wrong? What's wrong? You know, looking right. for something to fix. <laughs> what's the hardest, right? most scariest thing we need to deal with right now, right? I mean, yeah, we... yeah. You know, he'd feel any tension whatsoever. What's wrong? And uh, and he was very sensitive as Piscean. He didn't let it on, and I didn't understand it at the time. But being a Cancerian now, and my wife Luba is a Piscean, there's this mixture of water that's just amazing. Uh, what is also amazing is that she came from the USSR originally. She defected here in 1989, uh, arrived here in 1990, actually. So she grew up as a... Um, student in the USSR and their educational system was such that they would assess the children at five years old and determine what strand they would go in and, and then they would support them throughout all that. She had a choice of being a uh, gymnast or pianist and she chose piano. So she ended up graduating from one of the most exquisite music, music schools in Russia, Mussorgsky College in St. Petersburg now was Leningrad and then uh, was in uh, Rome with the choir accompanying them and she decided she was going to defect so she went to the American embassy and within three days had her paperwork took her a year to get the plane fare and ended up in Arizona and within a few weeks went to work for Arizona State University's uh, choral and dance department so it was really nice you know shift for her however Growing up in that culture is much different than the American culture. And mm -hmm. we didn't realize how, you know, what the intricacies were until we started bridging our worlds in relationship and unfolding the layers and having those, you know, tense discussions sometimes that weren't really arguments, but they were expressive mm -hmm. and, um, and necessary in order to find that balance and consistency in the depths of our own relationship. Now, that's one thing that's really hard for men to do because mm -hmm. they're most of them 
don't know how to express emotions, don't know how to express feelings, don't know how to sense. They, I think they know how to sense, they just don't report it because we got a three brain system going on, right? We got the gut, the heart, and the head. And the gut's where we feel the intuitive vibrations, if you will. Mm. Women are great at that. They rely on their intuition because they're responsible for kids, right? right. The protector. Right. Man's out, you know, hunting and gathering and mm. mother's at home taking care of the kids, making sure that they're safe. Mm -hmm. So guys haven't really had the opportunity to do that until recently with single parent families, right? Mm -hmm. Still not necessarily knowing how, the depth of sensitivity and compassion and mm -hmm. uh, understanding and curiosity that needs to be present mm -hmm. without the attachment of thinking what we know is the only thing that we can draw from. Right. Mm -hmm. So that for a man is almost, I see it as an excruciatingly fun process now. Mm hmm because it's one of the things, you know, Harv, uh, T. Harv Eckert says, what you do anywhere, you do everywhere. So I like the habit of self-examining first. Mm -hmm. Where am I with all of this? And then how can I assist? What's there for me to do without pushing and pulling right. energy, mm. agenda, mm. Mm -hmm. right? What needs to be done is, is the question. And it's not necessarily what I think needs to be done or what the other person thinks need to be done. Mm -hmm. It's okay, let's examine this and ask the critical questions so that what needs to be done can actually bubble up and become apparent. Mm, yeah. And then act upon that. Right, right. Yeah, there's a lot there that you covered, you know, with all these things we were talking you were talking about. Um, but I, I think that uh Looking at the traditional model of uh, then in the marriage you had of, okay, mom is at home taking care of the kids, you know, and we're out, you know, doing whatever we're doing to provide for the family. Um, you know, that traditional model, like, is very needed. I mean, I think it, uh, everybody goes, For a time, was, maybe. I and however, a lot of it worked. Work was kind of needed you know if you think about it <laughs> well to I, some I, degree I, yeah yeah daniel but uh, you know at the same time and at the same time mm -hmm. you know dad was saying yeah go to work for a good company retire do all that he worked for general motors for 38 years as a tool and die maker mm -hmm. he used to say you know anybody can give you a shot but i can make the needle mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so that kind of you know the creator energy which I picked up on so in recognizing that it's okay how do you handle things what do you do and, and okay I, I i did everything that i thought was what i was supposed to do right mm -hmm. including you know putting my best foot forward in marriage job and church all three of them fell through in a matter of three months yeah, and my job fell through because I was pushing for interpersonal skills classes in in the nineteen eighties mm -hmm. at a, in a corporation. It was an aerospace company. It was a defense contractor that's built on a military command and control structure. And when you're dealing with interpersonal skills, it kind of moves in the other direction to where you're you're treating people like you want to be treated, not beating them over the head to get what you want. Right. Right. And so I behaved to the former and I had a couple of guys, supervisors come to my cubicle and say, hey, what are you doing? I had no idea the effect I was having. I was at the top of the production list and 35 people. I was the youngest in the department. I think I was 27 at the time, mm -hmm. maybe. maybe. Um, so I saw just by example and by my own experience, what the difference of behavior would produce. Mm -hmm. So in 1988, I'm thinking, okay, I, I've, I'd had a pretty rich metaphysical life already, and I knew spiritual practices and, and how well they worked. And I also knew best practices in business from the schooling I was taking place uh, or it was I was involved with. And so I looked at how to bridge these. And in doing so, um, the name Be the Dream mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. came up. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's a perfect you know, business name. So I registered it in January of 1988. 
and um, I'm still using it. I, I do transformational yeah. coaching today uh, uh, under that banner. Right. Um, right. So those kinds of things, once that best effort comes to a close because it didn't fit. Mm -hmm. And then after my divorce and leaving the corporation, nearly being expelled from church, but deciding to leave, you know, I, mm -hmm. uh, later, then my life opened up and the following summer was just an amazing reclamation of spirit, if you will. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. from that point, I had said to my dad, you know, I tried it your way. Mm -hmm. Didn't work. Right. So I'm asking you to just allow me to do it my way and I'm going to follow my heart right? and see where it leads and then learn that process of inquiry, observation, uh, flow. You know, what I came down, you know, years later, I recognize it as the focus of attention, intention, and interaction. Mm -hmm. And that's what leads us forward. If we're going toward our dream, our vision, our goal, then the universe, whatever you want to call it, God, giver of data, right? It provides those breadcrumbs, mm -hmm. synchronistic events, serendipitous moments, those kinds of things. And it's up to us to be aware of when those happen mm -hmm. so that we can acknowledge it, observe it, and then step into it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm which is a different pattern of behavior than most men are used to because they're used to seeing a goal, creating an action plan right. and working it to death. Right. Let's get right at it. Right. Absolutely. And women too. Right. Uh, Cause that's sure. Uh, yeah. Well, we're yeah. taught, you know, start with the, the vision in mind as entrepreneurs. Yeah. Start with the vision in mind, then back it up is the steps that, you know, ask the questions is, okay, how'd I get there? All right. How'd I get there? Then back it up a little further. How do we get there? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, bring it down to the basic day-to-day -day tasks that are necessary in order to take that incremental step towards the goal. Totally. I now, mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just like, like in the spirit of just sharing, like what you're talking about as an example I was talking to somebody, we're looking at creating a retreat next year. And I'm like, okay, well, a typical way to do this is we think about what we're going to offer on the back end of the retreat. And we build, we build everything from that, from the way. And then sure. I, I said, and we, and I started us down that road for, for a little, little bit. And then we're talking, we're like, well, then again, we could just create the event and just see what springs out of that, you know, like. We don't have to just do it the way everybody is, is you know, certain marketers sure. anyway would say. Well, this, this is kind of what Otto Sharma and does with the theory and, you. Yeah. And then what I've learned is like, probably, usually for me anyway, I've had the best success when I let it naturally emerge rather than I do some kind of process like that where I'm going men to more mentally, yeah, intuitively to a degree, but mentally right. try to figure it all out, you know. Now, what was it like? As they say when you were trying to do the prescriptive version what's that what was it like when you're trying to do the prescriptive version something that you planned out and i think it doesn't aid happen start starts enough to feel connected that's yeah. a, that was, that's why we didn't stay on that track too long because they're like yeah or it could figure itself out and then i was like yeah right. it's you like know, an but, affront to intuition <laughs> But that we, that's what, how we're conditioned because we've been told, start with the end in mind and focus on, write down your plan, do those actions, hit that goal, baby, no distractions, hard work, focus. <laughs> now, that's not to discount right. that part of it, that work, because yeah. it too yeah. has to be done. You're not going to reach someplace if you don't have a map to get there. Sure, yeah, sure. Right? At least some map. Right. Uh, exactly. the, the journey is going to take you all kinds, you know, you'll have many tangential moments. Mm -hmm. that you know you'll spin off and then you'll come back but you know when you look at that circle right and, and we look at it two-dimensionally if you tweak it to the side and think of all those tangents that are part of it you know it, that line is or that circle is made up of the points where those tangents connect and there are you know sometimes infinite numbers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. to be able to understand that allows one to kind of step back go slow mm -hmm. in order to go fast right? because you're much more in tune 
with what is naturally occurring as opposed to what's forced. Right. Right, exactly. So, I mean, getting back to some of the life thing, other life things you're talking about. Okay, this is this is a model. This is how it goes. Uh, I'll go to work. You'll be you're having the kids. You'll be taking care of the kids. That's the model. We go to church on Sundays or Saturdays, whatever your tradition is, and we're going to love each other. We're going to love God, and that's that's it. End of story. There is no other way to live life. You know, I kind of idea. Well, I, I kind I've of always through. done it. This is the best life possible. Always do your best. That's the way to go. And, uh, and and then yeah, I mean, uh, but the 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 sense of breaking out of that tapping in whatever you know, and you, we look at even U.S. history, probably what '60s more so, probably starts breaking down more and more those ideas that maybe there's other ways to do life. Then there's well, birth control. And you know, birth it, control it's like um, yeah. Rianne Eisler first presented, maybe not first, but she was one of the most well known. Uh, writers that presented things in the chalice and the blade of this dominant society that's patriarchally driven mm -hmm. and the thought of the matriarchy doesn't mean you know it's like we're not shifting from a patriarchy to a matriarchy we've had the matriarchy already mm -hmm. that, that was a long time ago um, mm -hmm. now we've got the patriarchy however it's not necessary to be dominant. It has to be balanced, right? The, the masculine, feminine inside each of us, as well as in relationship. There's an equanimity to it, an equality to it that we haven't fully recognized yet or acquiesced to. That's the tough part, right? Because it is, it's a letting go. It's an acquiescing to that in order for it to merge in front of us or in relationship with another, whether it's during conversation or just in life in, in general. Um, so those kinds of things are imperative, right? And as a man, as a man, I learned that I can't think my way through a system built on vibrations. I've got to sense my way through it. It just stands to reason. Mm -hmm. right because now with quantum physics we're all vibrations we're all energy there's no physical form there appears to be yet that's because of the condensation of the vibratory you know the, the vibrating strings that form into these things that we call body that has senses and that inherently um, one of the other things i learned is uh, through one of my metaphysical experiences that we're all cosmic consciousness condensed into form just unaware you know the vedas even say this fifteen thousand years old we're all divine threads connected to source capable of god consciousness well what does that mean well the god consciousness is unconditional love what's that feel like well it has an effervescent iridescent high-pitched sensation to it right that's just that's as much describable as I could give it. it. It's in, you feel it in the light. You feel it in the presence of a spiritual master. You feel it in your release to everything that is in those moments where you can just be silent inside. You automatically have, and some feel or hear that high-pitched frequency. The Hindus call it the Shabda which they call the sound current, which is a combination of all the vibrations on the planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Weird stuff, right? And yet we have all of these things in our history that have been discovered, expanded upon, revealed, shared, mm -hmm. and yet we're still not listening. Now, I think coming out of COVID, guys have, you know, they had a chance, no jobs, right? Couldn't go to work, some remote, still. You're sitting at home obsessing on self hygiene and sequestrated. What are you going to do? I hope you talk to yourself. You do a little self examining. You know, who am I really? What's going on here? What's the truth of this situation? How do I feel about it? What do I want to do with my life? What am I willing to do as a result of that choice? Mm -hmm. And then proceed in that direction. Because you start asking the questions, the answers are going to show up. Like Rilke says, you know, you don't, you can't answer the question with the information or the knowledge you have. 
you have to let life offer the answer and it right. will it what, takes time and then what's the alternative to that is to to think something on the outside is going to going to show up uh, hopefully if god willing <laughs> uh right something's going to so hopefully something will help me to survive or maybe th maybe even thrive and like this is a fear-based mentality right yeah like like uh uh if i know and then if you just tell me what to do i'll go do it like a good soldier and then i'll and oh, then guys are task driven right yeah 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 or i'll figure it out let me think really hard about this i'll figure it out and you just keep spinning the same wheels <laughs> they come up with the well, same what it answer. comes to though i've found is a basic desire that every one of us have, have that we're unwilling to explore and that's simply to love and be loved yeah yes yeah that's too simple yeah yeah the mind loves complexity right it's got to be infinitely more complicated than that <laughs> that's Way our nature isn't it yeah that's part of our nature right the, the mind mm -hmm. Our thinking mind. Well, the universe is extremely complex, and yet it's very simple. Yes. You know, when you start from that place of viewing things from one, mm -hmm. right? Um, example of uh, um, Dudley Lynch, um, wonderful guy, wrote a book called The Strategy of the Dolphin back in the 1980s. It was an organizational development um, exploration. And then later he wrote another book called The Mother of All Minds. Mm -hmm. And in that, he expresses that basically right now we've got two different versions going on. We've got an alpha mind and an alpha chassis, which is steeped in competition. Mm -hmm. And then we have a beta mind still with the alpha chassis that mm -hmm. understands oneness or at least can grok the concept, mm -hmm. right? Now, how does that equate? Well, when you start thinking about, okay, if all things are one, if everything's connected, what might that look like? What might it feel like? What might I be able to observe as a result? Those things then begin to show up in, you know, serendipitous moments, synchronistic events. You know, you think something, something happens, or you hear a noise, or you're having a conversation about self-awareness, and a bee starts flying around the light, and you can't hear yet this happened right <laughs> it's like six months ago or something like that my wife and i were out on the back porch middle of the night um energy was high i couldn't sleep so we went outside to have a conversation about why we couldn't sleep and the high energy and stuff like that so we're having this really deep conversation and i keep hearing it's like 11 30 midnight i keep hearing this buzzing and i'm looking around and I, it sounds like a beat but i'm thinking 11 30 12 o'clock night really right honeybees don't you know <laughs> fly at night and so i'm looking around and finally i look up and we've got these dome lights that are about a foot in diameter and there's a bee right in the center of it and it's it's just flying it's not moving it's just hovering in the center of this light and i'm like oh my god bee light mm -hmm. and i said <laughs> i said lua check it out i said there's our answer be light it's right. that simple right. and then i had the curiosity i said okay now that's a random event <clears throat> it's still flying in the center of it is it possible if we deepen our awareness will it affect the trajectory of the bee mm -hmm. and so we took a deep breath kind of you know we're a little more present with the moment and sure enough the bee started flying in about a six inch diameter circle mm -hmm. and i said okay there's another once is random, twice is a pattern. Uh, I wonder if we can deepen it even more and see if it'll change again. So we took another breath and almost instantly it's flying around the perimeter of the light. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, wow, mm -hmm. right? How does that happen? How does that kind of connection? Am I just, am I imagining it? Mm hmm or was it actually happening? You know, the proof was right there in the experience. Am I willing to accept that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or am I going to choose to ward it off as a coincidence or some other random event, right? That's our tendency. We second right. guess everything. Exactly. Like, how, 
Like, how is it that, uh, again, all my, my listeners that listen to me a lot, like, how do I, how do I think I want a, a steak and order lobster and they bring me the steak and the lobster because, because they feel bad. They knew I wanted the steak because the word got out. Turf and, and turf, turf, buddy. Right. Well, well, bring both to me. I mean, that little situation hasn't happened, but things just like that happen all the time in my life. And it's always when I'm in a relaxed state and I'm just, just a connection flow going on. And it just happens. Uh, oh, it's just coincidence. Yeah, after a thousand times or more, like you're like, yeah. it's like, yeah, I don't right. think this is a co co coincidence anymore, right? There's this flow that we're connected to. Well, there's and a certain point, you know, it's like you mentioned the Federation earlier. You know, I was introduced to them as a kid and um, nightly experiences um, going on board, a, a, or, well, I didn't know it was on board at the time. But I'd wake up in bed and I'd watch myself get out of bed, climb out my bedroom window, walk out into the pasture next to the house, and I'd rise up into this orange cigar-shaped cloud. And this happened a couple of times a month for about two years. Then uh, in, and I was eight to 10 about that time. And then I was 23, getting ready to move to Phoenix, still living in Indiana. But I was walking through a metaphysical bookstore in Muncie, Indiana at the time. And this book falls off the shelf in front of me. And I'm like, nobody else around, right? And like, okay, I go over it because I know already <laughs> somebody wants me to look at something. Yeah. And so I go over it and the book's laying cover up on the floor. And it's Ruth Montgomery's Strangers Among Us. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, interesting. Okay, so... I pick it up where it's open. I turn it over. The first paragraph that I read is paraphrased. The most common contactee, UFO contactee and experience in the late 50s and early 60s in the Midwest was the orange cigar shaped cloud. Mm -hmm. I had not given a second thought. I just thought all of these things were really cool. And I couldn't wait to go back when I'd wake up in bed the next morning. Never an idea of what happened inside. It, because my observer self and the physical would become one as I would go into the perimeter of the cloud. Then mm -hmm. I'd wake up in bed the next morning. It's like, whoo, that was so much fun. I can't wait to go back. Didn't know why. Mm -hmm. right? And then uh, occasionally I would even wake up with nosebleeds, which was consistent with contactee experiences, as I read later. Mm. And then when I moved to Phoenix, everything changed. Um, there was uh, an introduction, if you will. And... I had a really hard time accepting what they were saying my role is with them, right? And it was coming through psychic readings, through some visions, uh, but mostly from others that were sensitives. And they were saying, you know, hey, did you know? Did you know? Did you know that you are? Did you know that you are? And, you know, after you get six or eight of those, it's like, okay, maybe I ought to start paying attention, right? <laughs> I've talked to 10 psychics. They all told me the same thing. I hear those things all the time as a psychic myself. So they're always telling me, I've right. heard this so many other people. Yeah, I, there's a clue then. <laughs> so after a while, it's like, okay, I'll explore this. And, and then I start having experiences of being showing up in my room. I woke up one night, uh, I'm meditating and, and I don't know that I'm asleep, but all of a sudden I become conscious and I'm on a steel gurney in what appears to be a ship or a room with three grays, tall grays. Um, they look like they're in lab coats and they're plastered up against a wall. But when I came to, I sat, so now I'm, I got a, I normally sleep naked, but I've got a t-shirt on, on this table, right? And nothing on below it. Mm. But I wake up and I'm laughing. I've got these electrodes that are lining my sphincter. Hmm. And I'm like, come on, guys, what do you think you're doing? So I'm kind of half embarrassed, right? And laughing to make up for that. Mm -hmm. And yet my response to them was totally different than normal, right? Mm -hmm. Most people wake up in those kind of situations. They're scared shitless. Yeah. Right. Because they're totally out of control, don't know where they are. And mm -hmm. I at least had enough sense to not go there. Mm -hmm. But I was laughing. And, uh, and maybe there was a little bit of concern, but you know, and, and I'm pulling these things out as I'm talking to them. They're plastered up against the wall. I didn't think about it at the time as the energy that I carried with the laughter and as mm. sensitive as they are to it, mm. that's what pushed them away more than likely. Mm. Mm. Uh, 
But when, when I pulled the last one out, it felt like I uh, pulled a pubic hair, a little, little bit of a sting was all. Mm -hmm. And I opened my eyes up. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking, shit, right? That, there was a perfect opportunity to have a conversation and I blew it. <laughs> I blew it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so I closed my eyes and I'm thinking, oh, I want to go back. I want to go back. I want to go back. And I'm trying to figure out how to get there. And in that nothingness, yeah. There's a male figure that shows up in a cloak that's kind of a shimmering, um, and he, a deep, you know, warm voice. He says, "Next time, just relax. We're just trying to tune you up so we can communicate more easily. Mm -hmm. Next time, right? Okay. So that set that one up. What I found out the." Previous week, my girlfriend at the time and I were studying anatomy and specifically the central nervous system. She was studying to be a massage therapist. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we had learned a little bit about the perineal nerve, mm -hmm. which is a direct connect into the base of the spine. Now, what is the perineum end? The sphincter and the genitals. So, so whether it's doing anal probes too, they're working on that, <laughs> that old system, maybe. I don't right. know. Right. So this gives the anal probes a whole new meaning, right? Right, right? And so what it is is the science behind it is the if they have the technology to adjust your vibratory rate. They only do it subtly because that's the only thing that's necessary, is just a subtle shift. You know, it's like perspective, mm -hmm. right? And drawing. If you just mm -hmm. change it, you know, a degree. Yeah. Instead of, you know, where you're at, it's going to be, you know, tens of degrees by the time you get out anyway. So mm -hmm. that then proceeded into various other um, showings and arrivals and council meetings and all kinds of stuff that I've written books about. Uh, too much to get into here, but to suffice it to say, it's a reality for some of us. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I imagine some people would say, well, maybe you just, uh, that's just your imagination only, you know, you th thought this thing happened and is it even real? You know, what is real? You know, that'd be a whole nother. Jeff thing. Mishlove and I had a conversation about that when he interviewed me uh, several years ago mm -hmm. and he'd ask me, you know, is, is it your imagination or what? Uh, and I said, yes. Right. Right. It, <laughs> it's more. And, and then he understood what I meant. Right. Astute as he is. And then he talked about the imaginal realm, which is where this co-creative and interactive mm -hmm. realm resides. Mm -hmm. And that in order to gain there, it requires curiosity, first of all. Mm -hmm. Got to have it. If you're not interested, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Um, I can't say that 100%. Right, right. Typically, I would say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Typically, you got to have the curiosity. Um, traumatic events change that because then you you have the curiosity afterwards. Mm -hmm. But the um, how it unfolded is that you know we're here to learn how to work together to experience that loving and being loved, and as we grow together, as we have a new order, even new world order that appears that is harmony among planet and people. Mm -hmm. It's one that's emerging. Mm -hmm. It's that native design within each of us as cosmic consciousness condensed into form. Mm -hmm. We're just out picturing it here, unaware of the process and being curious enough about it in order for it to appear in some ways. Uh, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, the same summer that I had the experience here at the lake, I also was introduced to William Swigard's work in the multi-plane awareness and multi-level awareness. The process is, the multi-plane is the one I'll, I'll speak to. Uh, it's designed for a facilitator to take a participant through nine planes of consciousness and mm -hmm. integrating their bodies on each of those planes with using the light body to begin with to create it and then move with that projecting your consciousness into it. Mm -hmm. exquisite absolutely exquisite um that was 1989 in 2018 when i'm reviewing some of uh, jeffrey's 
interviews to get prepared for mine, I ran across Vernon Neppe's interview, and he's talking about the triadic dimensional distinction vortical paradigm. Mm -hmm. And what they, he and Edward Close put together was a quantum physics theory of everything paper, in and they published it in 2010, but they basically posit that consciousness, space, and time are tethered across nine dimensions. So here's some science that backs up my experience. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, and then I started looking, okay, where else does nine show up? Mm -hmm. And you've got the numerological, it, it's the completion, right? The uh, spiral dynamics, all the different levels. You've got the solfeggio frequencies. You've got, uh, let's see, there was another one in there. Um, but there's multiples of this, like fractals, right? Mm -hmm. That are ubiquitous. The whole, like Tesla is talking about the three, six, and nine, just yeah. kind of, it's a ubiquitous framework right. that's strewn across creation. And we just haven't recognized it all yet. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, we're very much evolving as uh, as a species, you could say, right? <laughs> and yeah, and yet, and yet we're just going back to where uh, we were before in some ways. <laughs> in our original states, yes. We, yeah. you know, when we first arrived, we were connected to everything. Mm -hmm. Then we got obsessed on the satiation of form mm -hmm. which took us away from that inner and put us into the outer and and now which is that masculine you know and now we're going back inside which is the the feminine the heart centered the the feeling the sensing mm -hmm. and it is more aligned with the natural natural construct of creation which mm -hmm. quantum physics is now proving than anything else that we've tried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And many authors have written about this. And Jeffrey even talked about, you know, reference Carl Jung um, in, in exploring that imaginal space. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, guys like this have been doing it throughout history. So if they've been doing it and we're looking for ways of reconnecting, then maybe it's good to go back and start digging into stuff like Jung and Nietzsche and the Vedas and you know, all the things that highlight that connectivity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even um, Bailey's work and Blavatsky's work and, and all the Russians are way ahead of us, mm. way ahead. Mm -hmm. They've accepted, embodied, welcomed this other realm of sensory expression and uh, reception right because we are transceivers and uh, um, Morovina um, Valentina Morovina did a uh, released a, her dissertation another she's a, a Russian academician and what that means is that's the highest title from their National Academy of Sciences mm -hmm. and she got it from her dissertation which online is called global mutation of humanity what she did was she took a 10-year study of all the different scientific information that was available that reveals the genetic mutations that are taking place as we ascend in consciousness. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. Boring to listen to because it's a dissertation. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's a boring format to take it in, right? <laughs> right. And there's an English subtitles as well, because she speaks in Russian. Uh, but my wife said, here, you got to take a look at this. She's saying the same thing you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exciting to see. See, it's 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 in there. It's out there and everywhere. Right. So it's it really there. is. Yeah. It's just you got to look. Yeah. 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 Oxy, gak, ask, look, you know, we were told that, too. Do we? Yeah, I just, yeah. This whole thing about you know, uh, you know, men and women evolving and you know, moving through the patriarchy and all that stuff. Uh, well, what what do you think we're moving into then? The the balance, the idea of balance, or well, what, or I have a, a real world, real life in the present moment example. 
Um, one of my interviews for One World in a New World uh, in January of 19, or of 19, yeah, where am I going? Uh, of 2021 was with, um, I'm sorry, 2022, was with the founder of Live and Let Live Global Peace Movement. He's a defense attorney here locally, and uh, I'd known him for years, thought he'd be great to interview. And then during it, I found out that he had started Live and Let Live in August of 2020. Mm -hmm. another event that happened through COVID, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I felt this immediate, I got to be involved. So we had lunch um, a couple of weeks later and I uh, told him I've got the skill set for an executive director if they need one. And it came out of my mouth and I thought right afterwards, like, what the hell am I saying, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. Um you know, you never get what you want unless you ask or present it, even though it sounds incredulous to your ego when you yes. do it. Yes. So the fact is you do it. And then uh, the important thing is you do it. So uh, mid that was mid-February, mid-March, I get a phone call. Hey, would you like to work with a woman from Hawaii that wants to step up as executive director too? Mm -hmm. And I said, perfect masculine feminine leadership this is an example of the new style absolutely i am on board yeah. and he said well you need to meet her and see if you know and, and so we did and i knew right our skill sets are completely compatible we both come out of a rich corporate understanding and many years of project management and organizational development and things like that and we get along like two peas in the pods have different views sometimes and yet we have this capacity and, and we know we are there. I'm hesitant to say as a divine purpose, that's what it feels like. Yeah. So here's that real world example of the bridge of masculine and feminine and learning how to work together in building an international, a global mm -hmm. organization. And we've got folks from Nigeria, from Australia, from Brazil, from Poland, from England, uh, you know, Kenya, Uganda, um, India. So we're, we've only been there for two and a half years. Our l official launch is going to be next March 1st. And uh, hopefully Mark will have his book done because that's part of what's been holding us up. His name is Mark Victor, by the way, and it's liveandletlive.org. So if your guests are interested in exploring it, please do so. We have two principles, a moral and a legal. The moral, be an excellent human. Aspire to be your best. The legal, don't aggress, which means long term, we are working towards calibrating the law to remove aggression. Mm -hmm. So that's the tangible result. Mm -hmm. That's going to take a while. Mm. However, somebody's got to start it because that's exactly. the practical and pragmatic area of the world that we have to deal with in order to do that. Right, right. Yeah, you got to lay the tracks down somewhere, start, starting somewhere. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, that's fantastic. It's so fantastic. I mean, uh, yeah. The, we need we need all that kind of leadership in the world you know right now i mean that's what's needed is one would think well 100 percent or feel i'll put it down one would sense it <laughs> yeah something different's got to happen right yes, you know yes. this whole warring crap is just you know is it possible that parents could just say no you're not going yeah that's true yeah yeah exactly it now, it's going to take that right you know, it's gonna take the abject refusal yes. to kill somebody yes. for any reason. Yes, 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 yes. There is never a good reason to kill anybody. Conversation can solve anything. We refuse to have them. At well, least the people leadership. that were cheering Trump to be dead about the assassination. Hit them next time. Well, I mean, Putin uh, back in 2000 or 2001. You'll work it out with them. You'll work it out with them. Just talk to them. See, that's that's, that's where we we reach a, a divide. What, I, what, what, what I've gone back to with all this reactivity that goes on in our world is 
I come back to the simplest truths that I learned decades ago. Stop reacting, start responding. We, everybody's reacting. Re reactivity. Oh my God, I don't know what happened. <laughs> right, right. You, you know, I mentioned Putin responding. just a every, minute ago. Every, your life will flow amazingly well. Every, Absolutely. Except Absolutely. when it's emerging and just receiving. Given the chance. Perfect. Right? Given the chance. There was an opportunity for that back at, when um, George Sr. was president and Putin said, hey, we would like to join NATO. George says, great idea. Takes it back to the US and, and to NATO. And they're like, mm. right? Mm. So there's this adversarial push or pull, you know, a, a, that's been taking place that a reasonable, rational human being would simply not entertain. Mm -hmm. Now, what's that say about our leadership? Are they reasonable and rational? No, I don't think so. They're power driven. They're right. hungry. They want resources. They want to command and control everything. That's the Western world. We're missing the Eastern. That's the, again, that's masculine. The Eastern's more feminine, mm -hmm. right? The all encompassing, how do we work together? you know the what is and traditionally is. yeah you're right i mean it is more the eastern I, I guess you could look at examples in the east that may not be that way i don't want to get any debates today but yeah traditionally i would say 100 percent. yeah sure well and, and you know I, prudence had his, his you know stuff i'm sure i don't know him personally i can't make any projections because all i've gotten is the information that i've been fed then most of it doesn't feel true what I do see is that he was the only one during COVID that sent supplies and personnel to help out in Italy. Mm -hmm. Now, if he was such a bastard, would he, you know, why mm -hmm. would he do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So those kinds of simple examples that we refuse to, to see uh, or explore Oliver Stone's interviews with him or another example. Mm -hmm. Um, Tucker's mm -hmm. got a little off track because he was too impatient to listen to the prep necessary to understand the answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have impatience. Mm -hmm. you know that I, I like to practice the five P's, patience, perseverance, persistence, passion, and purpose. Now, in order to do that, you got to have the sixth in play, which is practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to listen. I know that much. <laughs> we got to really listen. You know, listen, deep. listen to understand, not listen to look for a break in order to interject right. what you want to say. Wait a minute, Wait a minute Zen. I need to get in there now. <laughs> Objection. Unfortunately, I, I'm probably one of the worst because, <laughs> you know, I get prompted by things when I feel something and it's like, oh, I got to emote. Right. right. Um, and yet, you know, in following the uh, guidelines of Redfield in the Celestine Prophecy and the Third Insight, right? You wait until you feel that compelling urge internally to speak before mm -hmm. you say a word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had enough practice at th this that it comes pretty quick sometimes. <laughs> and it often, you know, I think, oh, I just interrupted. But no, I didn't. And they're okay. And I'm okay. And it's all good. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to, I mean, it's interesting because the different conversations with different people, I'm, it flows differently for me. I was talking to my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, 16 year old daughter on the way home from one of our family trips. And we were talking, we talked deep, real deep stuff sometimes. And we were talking Isn't that and, great? I, I, and I found like we kept interrupting each other and we were both getting frustrated. I, I just acknowledged it. I says, seems like we just collide in our communication at times and she says yeah and yeah that's it. and that's happened and then we basically were able to make it okay and then it stopped right. happening so much right then it started, pretty much started well, I, th I think excitement has a lot to do with it mm -hmm. yes right because these kinds of conversations are so rare and yes. for those who are longing to have them mm -hmm. it's like a kid in a candy store mm -hmm. we don't know how to shut up because we're just you know <laughs> 
right? Finally, I get to share. Yeah, somebody's <laughs> listening, right? <laughs> and who was it? Um, Augsburger, I think, that said that being heard to normal people is exactly like being loved. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll say in my own experience, receiving being listened deeply, that's with my wife, Deb, like it's one of the number one attractor factors is she deeply listens to me when I when I speak typically. I mean, that well, was- you're kind of a deep person anyway, Daniel. <laughs> I'm like, I, and then you feel loved. You feel like, okay, wow, I'm really- I'm really being seen for who I am. She's not saying a thing, but, she's, but the deep listening is like, makes you feel validated somehow or heard or understood and loved and supported. And, and um, that's often, you know, what I hear people say about me, the space, the space you hold, it's safe. It's, you know, I feel like I can be myself. I can say anything. And yeah, I remember like, in, even back in grad school, when I was in grad school, getting my master's in clinical psychology, I remember there was some a Chinese student there, and she's she's telling me all kinds of crazy stuff about <laughs> why are you telling me all this stuff? Why I she's like because you're Daniel, because you're Daniel. Right. That's such a big right. thing to tell me. And Daniel can get it now. So what it does, and maybe you can uh, validate this for me, because someone is listening, you're flowing, and you can also listen to yourself. Mm more deeply in the words you speak and and you know as a clinical psychologist it's not the questions you ask it's how the person responds and what they're listening to in their own voice right mm -hmm. it gives them that growth mm -hmm. um when we're heard when we're being listened to we have that presence and and ability because we don't have to say no I, i'm trying to get you to listen to me right please listen to me Right. Or you're interrupted and say, no, you didn't let me finish, please. You know, and, and that just, wow, it, it totally throws that flow into a new spiral because now you got to wait for it to come back. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. If you lose connection to the flow, then yeah, you, then you have to, oh, it's awkward. We need to get back into the flow and all that. And it's critical to recognize that. And those are things in conversations that need to be it's that inner right thing that mm -hmm. that we live half inside half outside we're bereft of telling others what's going on inside of us because we don't think anybody cares or mm -hmm. if we do they're going to deem us as crazy insane or weird mm -hmm. right and, and distance themselves mm -hmm. so by practicing this and, and especially in relationships what you do at home sprinkles out everywhere what you do anywhere you do everywhere all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. right so this is a, a great way to practice, especially when you know that you are loved and you are loving without any attachment. Yeah. Then that can grow and you can recognize, oh, OK, we just got off. Um, you know, when Luba and I first got married, I said to her, you know, foundation I want to work on is or from is faith, love, and trust, period. If we get outside of that, one of us recognizes it, we need to say, hey, wait a minute, we're, we're kind of off. And of course, when those, <laughs> those cultures start banging their heads towards each other, that's a difficult place to be in. Um, and yet we did it. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Over time, we, we worked through those, uh, I, I like to say we're all in relationships on mm -hmm. the ocean of emotion, mm -hmm. seeking safe harbor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Very cool. Very cool. Well, I, I I'd love to keep going, uh, but uh, we do have a time frame today. So I'm wondering if you could share with people. Well, it feels like too. there was a pregnant pause. There, it's like okay. This feels complete. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm like, okay, all right, we're about done, maybe. But uh, yeah, I, uh, if people want to connect with you, and I know you have a gift for people too today, um, if you want to tell them about that, yeah, with, where they can connect more. Sure, absolutely. Um, my coaching site is be the dream.com. 
I have a digital vitae at zenbenefiel.com, which has a row of buttons across the top. It's got all the different websites and themed that I have that I've created over the years. And then uh, my podcast is on YouTube and it's on all the major podcast stations as well. Three weeks behind, by the way, because I didn't get started simultaneously. I was still an amateur, right? I didn't know these things existed at the time. Um, it, it's called One World in a New World. And it's also available on uh, one of my newest reformations, if you will. I've had planetarycitizens.net as a web domain since 2010, showcasing those that are doing things in the world toward this harmony among people and planet. Mm -hmm. In December, August last year, we filed for nonprofit status, um, which in America, that's a, a 501c3, and not knowing that there was an additional one that is available. So we got the paperwork back in December, approved. We got a 509A2 instead, which is like a 501c3 on steroids. It's a bridge. It's a hybrid because now we can do business mm -hmm. as well as collect donations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we right. can earn income. Right, right. Right. So this is displayed on planetarycitizens.net now, and it's broken down through the co-creation wheel that came out of Spiral Dynamics and Barbara Marx Hubbard's work. And each of those sectors are broken down into the specifics of what it's about, what a planetary citizen might be able to do on an individual level. I'm working on creating the collective levels and, and having those that are working in each sector as pioneers also referenced so that it mitigates or even diminishes the amount of silos that we have currently. Not that they were intended, but most people who've been doing this kind of work for decades, unbeknownst to others, which most of us have been, They've created their own silo because they got the blinders on. They're just focused. They don't know anybody else, anything else. And, you know, so mm -hmm. now it's time for these folks to be acknowledged, honored, connected to others and building this synergy that now we can expand globally with similar concepts that can be applied, for instance, uh, regenerative cultures that can be applied bioregionally. Mm -hmm. So these are all effective solutions for growing together and learning how to operate as a single entity, a unified world. And until we do that, then the guys we were talking about earlier with the Federation, they won't get involved. They will seed us with things that we can do and guide us in doing that, but they will not show up until we're ready. And the only way that we can get ready is to work as one and demonstrate that we can do that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's yeah, a whole other discussion, but yeah, they, they think we're just all too, way too crazy for now. Right? <laughs> we're not ready for that. We can't take it. <laughs> well, it yeah, I mean, we're we're all silos in competition with uh, either uh, uh, alpha male or female at, at the head of the pyramid, and they're still all in competition. Well, we we haven't learned how to collaborate in order to do this, you know. And right. an example of okay, what might let's say we learn how to collaborate? How might we recognize that in the real world? Mm -hmm. Right, Northern Africa, average population a dollar a day what kind of living conditions do you think that makes i will I, and I'm, i am absolutely not serious but i always say i always say how, how much do the goods cost there though like it makes a massive difference but yes a dollar a day sounds very um, on, nigeria on... it's pretty much the same right yeah. um and i would imagine it's others because goods cost and the manufacturers are all out of country at their level of income and sales and price points and all of those kinds of things so we got to level the playing field here somewhat now that's going to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. when it happens mm -hmm. however it needs to can we 
look at ourselves, commit to this process, not knowing exactly what's going to happen, knowing it's going to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. and be comfortable in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, those are big questions are within what you're sharing, right? So there's a lot of big questions in that, um, you know. Because sometimes the idea of leveling the play, playing field, it means we need to take away from you to give to them, you know, and that's going to be uncomfortable. That's one concept, right? But I really think it's, um, it's well, there's capitalism high. or socialism. That, that's the word right now, way. right? And, and yeah. capitalism has no giving, although there is voluntary giving mm -hmm. from those who have capitalized on the system. Mm -hmm. Socialism, you know, mm -hmm. so capitalism just basically takes uh, and you know, for profit, socialism takes for service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's the hybrid there? Mm -hmm. You know, can we move from profit uh, profit over people and planet mm -hmm. to people and planet over profit? You just got done telling me you're happy you, you can make money in your business. Right. So, I mean, so that's what I mean. Like, we have to look at, like, just period, like even beyond the, the labels, capitalism, socialism, it's like, what works from a yeah, love-based system where we're yeah. in our infinite expression and power and- Oh, that's and impossible, that, that, right? This is what you get from most people. That'll never happen. <laughs> well, you and I are proof that right. the impossible can happen. Right, right. Yeah, totally, totally. Totally. And there's so much more. I mean, um, there's just so many more opportunities. I mean, but yeah, I'd love to have you on another time on one of my, maybe the spiritual rock star will do, but like, we, we, I'd love to talk to you more about that whole idea because the conversations need to keep happening of what does that actually mean then? Because we know if we just drop ship them food, for example, right, that's not the answer. Yeah, and we don't know if, that they're going to get it. Deep, deep, deep. The answers are deep. Deep, yeah. there's deep answers. They're not simple answers. They're deep answers. And but I think people want to think it's easy. Like just redistribute wealth. That'll work. No, it won't. But we have to we have to shift our consciousness. That's what that needs to happen. That's right. a, that's what it is. It always comes back. We to shift that. the consciousness, everything will help else will happen naturally. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Whatever's meant to happen from there will happen from there. So totally yeah. agree. All right. Well, so great. I'd love to talk more. You know, I, I'm Absolutely. here to talk to people. I, uh, <laughs> one last thing, because that reminded me that there was a 92 year old retired bank president here in the Valley. There was an article that was written about him in the New Times is what the paper was called. And he was quoted as and he still had his office in on the top floor of the bank building, downtown Phoenix. And he was quoted as saying, I'm just here to talk to people. Mm -hmm. guess what i did <laughs> it's like hello um i want to make an appointment so and the reason i did is i just written a paper for one of my degrees uh about an international cultural center this was 1989 mm -hmm. and so i went to talk with him presented him the concept um he said love it really good you need to go find the pieces now and then he went into, well, we had probably a 45 minute conversation about how his wife's psychic gifts helped him build the bank. Mm -hmm. He and his brother in the 30s and 40s bought in over 70% of the business into Arizona. Mm -hmm. She used tarot, astrology, uh, kinesiology, I mean, a number of things. And so here's a 92 year old guy, right? Yeah. Ex, you know, bank president. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If somebody like that uses those tools, why aren't we? Right. Exactly. Exactly. There we go. That's a great way to end the show. <laughs> Let's use those tools, guys. All right. Well, this is a really, really cool uh, connection, vibe, uh, energy, and also conversation with you today, Zen. I really appreciate you coming on today. Oh, I really appreciate you, Daniel, because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, lots of love to you and our listeners, and we'll look forward to 
chatting again soon with you all because this is one one big conversation isn't it guys okay bye for now namaste in la catch thank you for listening in to just two conscious guys talking where our mission is to impact millions of men ultimately to deepen their awakening by examining their consciousness of what's been unfolding for them with male stereotypes and programming 